you guys to give it up and give another big Texas welcome to Jose Gomez. And thank you. Jose comes to us today from Canada, well, via Venezuela, uh, and, and then through Canada, and then down to Houston. And Jose just got a promotion. He's elected to announce it here today and share it with all of his friends here in the audience. Um, I was going to say that he was previously, or is previously the senior industrial consultant, but now he is the principal consultant for Dragos. So when I tell you to go see the principal, now you know who I'm talking about. So he has extensive experience in OT, ICS security solutions for Fortune 500 companies, specializing in secure application development and risk management. So thank you so much, Jose, for being with us here today. Take over. There you go. It's all yours. All right. Thank you so much. Um, first, I'm going to say thank you for staying all the way until the last one. We say the best for the last. I hope sometimes that's the spirit for this. But we're going to go pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, so what the agenda will look like. Yeah, so we're going to go into a quick introduction so you have a background why I developed this, uh, this talk. Uh, we're going to go to the current threat landscape. Then we're going to go into the principles of defensible architecture. Uh, we're going to touch uh, those points of uh, how to manage those um, uh, key aspects of the defensible architecture to achieve and manage those evolving threats. Uh, then, of course, I'm going to give you the tools current tools that you're already having in your environment that you can use to fortify your OT uh, environment. Um, and then, of course, common security practice that nowadays we say common, but now not that common. Uh, and how we integrate all together into like a really good cybersecurity program. And we're going to end it also Q&A. So please, by all means, uh, I'm a really chatty person. So feel free uh, to hit any questions that you may have, um, even though it's at the end of the day. So we have plenty of time to so we can stay. No, nobody's rushing us out here, right? So that's great. So who I am? So. Um, I was already introduced, right? But uh, my name is Jose, so I'm a principal industrial consulting at Dregos. Before Dregos, I was a network security architect where I developed solutions for four to 500 companies. And before that, I was working with the electric grid back in Venezuela. Uh, I hold a bunch of certifications, and um, currently I do uh, cybersecurity assessments and uh, vulnerability assessments and cybersecurity program reviews, tabletop exercise, and help with some incident response and pen testings with the Dragos team, specifically the Dragos service team. So we're going to talk a little bit, and I, I try to put a lot of information into the slides, the slides that are going to be available, but I give you an overview of what I consider is the current threat landscape for OT. There are two major players, what I would say, that are a current threat to the uh, OT environment. One is something like both sites or uh, Boltifon, uh, according to Microsoft, uh, that basically they are there uh, targeting the electric power generation, transmission, and distribution. Definitely, if you are part of the power grid or electric grid, you should check them out. There is a lot of information about it. And early on, I think our friend Marcus made a really great talk about that. And uh, feel free to, uh, that's a great resource to uh, evaluate the TTP. Now, I need you to pay attention here of what are the key components and what has changed uh, nowadays when it comes to cybersecurity threats, and especially the ones that we evolved in Dragos. Uh, as you are aware, uh, we find out both different in one of the client's customer's environments when we react to one or, or incidents, right? And it was there lurking in the shadows, basically doing nothing malicious. And we, we were lucky enough to catch in the early phase and the detections on the process. And we identified that the TTPs are not matching what the previously known for, uh, were doing before. Um, so this is a pretty interesting, unique landscape. And you need to be aware of what is the intent and the motivation of all these new threat groups. Right? Before, we were looking at threats that were trying to catch or uh, do disruption, disruption operations, trying to like, do malicious activities. But nowadays, more and more, including the two new threat groups that we 
uh, to the year in review report from Dragos that we track, um, including uh, Loranite and Gananite. Look at the intent and the motivation for all these threat groups. It's espionage. I think uh, the threat is, um, the OT threat landscape is evolving, and now it's not looking into disruption, and it's more looking into exfiltrating data. But here is the key. When we talk about IT, we look at, okay, FX trading data, we talk about terabytes, right, the data. When we talk about OTS filtrating data, we're talking about kilobytes, right? What happened in the previous scenario when we were uh, dealing with wall sites is that they were in the environment, they got access, they get the data, and it slowly but surely were to exfiltrate all the data when it comes to PLC configurations and um, network diagrams and things of that nature. So that means that you tools, or you DLP, your data loss prevention tools and things like that, are not looking into those pieces to, oh, it's looking for credit cards or it's attacking my PLC. No, they are just grabbing that information, take it out, and if you never notice until you are in the network detecting and looking for those activities. So it's not something that is gonna be in the network raising alerts or getting all the whistles out to the, your knock or suck. You need to be looking for it. So that's the, the current landscape. Of course, keep in mind, I put in there who are the targets of these organizations. Um, and if you are part of that uh, uh, likelihood that you are target of one of these um, trade groups, Please reach out, like we have free resources available that you can download, and there is plenty of information out there about how you mitigate this. But later on, we're gonna talk about more how you can do uh, to mitigate this. Uh, the second threat that I consider for OT and ransomware, and before you throw tomatoes at me, here, here we're talking about ransomware, it's in industries that has OT environments, right? We're not saying here that, yes, like, okay, the PLC had a ransomware screen, okay? I, I want to put that out of the, the, the equation here. We're talking about companies that had an OT environment that got ransom and could affect operations. So you can see it's a pretty large number right now. We're talking about like 900 uh, events, in fact, there are so many ransomware events that we used to put out a report every month, every quarter, every quarter. And now we are doing every, every week, we had a report out uh, of how many events are putting into like our Intel report, um, how many events are happening currently when it comes to ransomware. But you think, okay, maybe, Right, um, I'm not a target, but here is the interesting fact. So if you see 25% of the uh, ransomware attacks are associated with lockpick and black uh, basta uh, followed by 9% each. But when you come to like the Conti and lockpick victims, here is the information and data that you need to consider. 69% of the victims has less than 500 employees. So when you think about another target of ransomware, people think that ransomware is only targeting like the big, big companies, the Fortune 500, the ones that are challenged, the hackers. No, they go after the long hanging fruits, individuals, the small companies that don't have the resources to protect them and go after this target because a lot of them, once that you are target, uh, when you, once that you are at ransom, it adds up really quick. So you slowly but surely, you're getting 69%, right? And 90% less than one billion in revenue. Now, Lockbig is 80% of all the victims are less than 500 employees. So if that's not scary, well, think about more because this is coming directly from the CIS integrator. So this is a report out, and we're talking here about exactly uh, Texas data. So I found this is super interesting, so we added to the slides. And you can see there, of course, Texas is one of the biggest ones, but we had targeted uh, um, uh, operations, like literally facilities that were there in being targeted by other trade groups actors. So you will say, well, how we fix that, right? Super easy, right? So you just implement this and that's it. Like that quick five step program that we can do. Like it's not as simple, I know, but this is a framework that we're gonna talk about it. Um, uh, we using as a reference the five critical controls that so that's the Sans white paper, which our CEO Rob Lee was part of it. And, um, and we had the five modules over there and today we're gonna go 
in a deep dive into defensible architecture. Of course, keep, keep in mind that this is the Venezuelan hard talking here. We're gonna use as much as we can with the tools that we currently have. We're trying to avoid e going the easy solution and just buying something new. Um, I'm really passionate about number two and number three and number four. So if you ever have a question, topic, or talk about that, feel free to reach out. I can talk about that for hours. So what is defensible architecture? Defensible architecture is these five key components mixing together is what we consider is the criteria for a defensible architecture. Uh, number one, of course, we're gonna have an assets inventory, an asset identification. Number two, your log collection, and this is really close to what an incident responder will like to have at the moment that you activate the retainer, okay? And we're gonna talk about that more later. Firewalls, of course, segmenting firewall uh, environments and networks. Firewalls, my favorite topic and all. Uh, be able to shift into defensible cyber position quickly, and we're gonna talk about what is cyber position, defensible cyber position, what is that? So we're gonna deep dive into that later on. And of course, we're gonna continue enhancing these, all these four previous roles so we can continue evolving with the continued threats. Because intents and target change, and we need to keep doing uh, assessments to improve. All right, thank you so much. That's it. That's the talk. That's all you can do. No, just kidding. So, <laughs> just like uh, everything else, so it's not that easy. Um, and now we're gonna deep dive into what we're saying of what, how can we can achieve defensive architecture. First, I want to make sure uh, you understand in the comparison that I do. There is a difference between hardening and new solutions. And I always explain this with a door. Oh, the door. How can we secure this room? Right, or we find the key, we replace the key log or all of that, or I just hire somebody just to stand on the door 24 seven, right, and be there for me. I don't have to deal with that. He will report all the incidents. He will do all the jazz, next generation, AI, blockchain, all of that that individual has in front of that door. So it will be great, right? That's not where we're here, okay? We are looking for how we do the key. So first, remember we're talking about asset visibility. How we do asset visibility? First, if you are starting into your cybersecurity journey, what I would recommend is identifying what are, and you probably hear this term, your crown jewels. What are the most important things that you can, um, they can affect your network? And this is really easy. Just talk with our operator. Hey, operator, what a bad day look like? What is that day that always make you quit your job? And they will tell you exactly, oh, it's that HMI right there. That freaking thing breaks, and there is like three days with troubleshooting. And then you, okay, you take that, and you, now you put into like an aspect of, okay, that's a critical component. What logs I have from that? Okay, what interact with that asset? And from there, you slowly untangle this process operation that help you because now you're understanding the process and help them because now you are identifying the locks necessary to help in case that there is an incident that involved that asset, right? And we as Zegos, we have like a, a web paper relating to how to do a crown jewel analysis methodology. And is here uh, on the right. That's a summary of what a good asset visibility will look like. We have the understanding what is normal, right? And then you go to verifying those OT assets. And please include the IoT, and I put it there because sometimes there is a merry association between physical cybersecurity and cybersecurity as, as a whole. So uh, it's on a, a like, unavoidable, that sometimes you have your cameras, your badges, your in going into the OT network for reasons, right, that you have only limited bandwidth and things like that. So please include it into your asset inventory as a potential risk. Um, do a visualization, at, at least for myself, I'm a visual person, so I like to have these colorful diagrams and colorful stuff, so please do that. Um, and then, what we call the tech threats with high signal and low noise ratio. What is that? So, if you are in a situation where you don't have unlimited licensing for your SIM, right? You need to control what is important. So, what about creating laws for what it matters? The first thing that a threat actor will do is open an RDP session. Let's log RDP. 
first thing that we'll do is trying to exploit SSH, trying to exploit Telnet, do a, a, a network scan on port in HTTP. Things like that are really easy wins that won't damage your licensing agreement with the, with the SIMs that you currently have. So that's what it means with a high signal no, low noise ratio, that if you out of nowhere your PLC is trying to talk RDP with a Google IP. Like, like that's, that's where you should need and uh, have some detections on it, okay? But how identify in case uh, I don't know what is there, right? We have three ways, and again, and this is like we can here start a complete war about how to do monitoring because it can be passive, active, activity, and if you hear this, if you are being in the field for long enough, you're gonna see like the current fight between what is a passive monitoring solution and an active monitoring solution. I'm not here to debate that because you understand your risk and you know where you stand for it, but I'm, I'm gonna tell you that the auction side right there. So we have, of course, check your PCATs and network collection PCATs in your environment. Up the alarms and diagnosis in your SCADA system, check your factory talk, you name it, right? Like your vendor will provide you more insights that the other tools um, will have. So some uh, monitoring solutions like Nessus, Pinscap, and, uh, and MAP. And uh, when it comes to IT, we also have SNMP and NetFloat, and those tools, there are several of them that are open source and not that resource intense. So feel free to download, play with them, and see what value you're going to get the information. I'm pretty sure you're going to detect those assets that suppose like it shouldn't be in the OT network. That's the intention behind there, right? And of course, activity, and this is where we call the threat hunt. You go there and looking for an intention. In this case, downloading the TTPs for a, a, a known threat actor and go chasing them. That will be also a good activity for detecting. Okay. The second thing um, in, in our list on how we do a defensible architecture, if it comes to log collection, and especially something that we call collection management framework. Every topic that I talk here. Crown Jewel Analysis uh, Collection Management Framework is available in a white paper or free logs in either in the SANS portal or in the Dragos portal as well. So by all means, they can download even a template associated with those. And what is this? This is the first question that an incident responder will ask when you call for a retainer, when you call for, for an incident. Okay, I have this ransomware screen here. Okay, what are the logs? Where do you have the logs? I don't have any logs. Okay, close case. Let's wait for the next one. Because like there is nothing that we can do about it. Like there is nothing that we can chase. There is nothing that we can stand for it. We're just gonna wait for another hit. Maybe we have those logs, right? So just build those logs because that also gives us the importance of what the incident responder can plan out to give you the insight that you need to resolve the issue, to continue to see if the threat actor is in the network. An example that I always give is like we identify that the one of the controllers that was affected by one of the incidents only have like 24 hour rotation logs because it was so noisy that well, well as soon as we received a call, we saw the CMF and we say, we need the logs from this now. Because if we wait another hour, there are chances that those logs are deleted forever. So those are the situations that you only identify by having this, okay? So that's an example there. And of course, you need to keep improving uh, your logs. This is a const constant cycle that you can refine that low, low noise uh, ratio configuration where like, okay, now I can detect every event of RDP. Let's move to SSH, let's move to VNC, let's move and then you deep dive into these protocols that you are well known in the network that you can continue evolving your plan. You can do a tabletop exercise and identify, oh, you know what, that's right, I'm not lo doing Windows 7 logs, I'm not doing capturing the, the authentication on those PLCs, the authentication on my jump host and so on. So here is a quick example, and, and this is like the please, please uh, request for all the incidents out there, incident responders out there. It's like, please normalize your logs. There is something like really upset when you get into an incident responder, uh, sorry, an incident, and it takes more time to try to understand the, the, the structure of the logs 
than the actual incident, what was happening. So that's sometimes consuming and can delay the reaction from the incident respondent. So you can customize and make sure that you have a, a, a common structure across the lock, you have a tuning for the Windows event lock, so hopefully you're capturing, and please has an NTP, that's another one, because sometimes we jump into an incident and we see this PLC is in UTC, and this one is in Eastern time, and that one is in Central time, and then it becomes this like troubleshooting, making, trying to sen make sense to all these time frames and overlaps across multiple devices that sometimes the worst answer is that time is local, I don't know. Like, whatever the time was set up at the day or they, they, they put in, in, into production. So that's something to consider as well. And if you're pointing everything to a single NTP server, thank you. Thank you for the bottom of my heart. So thank you. It saves a lot of time. Um, log forwarding, please, like, this is a nice to have, like forwarding the logs to a sub and a sim for review. And again, you know, I know I say this is common sense, but you will surprise. I have another talk when we talk about the, the um, uh, configurations on firewalls, right? And you'll be surprised that 79% of the firewalls that I review with customers in the service team didn't have syslog events being forwarded to the SOC. And we're talking about medium and small, sorry, and small, medium and large companies, right? We're not talking about like uh, only small um, uh, companies have that. So please do that. And the event retention, talking back again, the story about the 24 hour events that was crucial to capture, okay? My favorite topic in here, please keep me here in the, in the last 20 minutes. Uh, this is firewalls, right? So when it comes to segmentation, there are different ways that we can do segmentations in the network. And one of them is like every time that I had an, uh, uh, a request from one of the clients saying, hey, you know what, I have this environment and I want to segment. These are the questions that are always trying to start the conversation, right? One is like, why are you segmenting? right? And how we we'll, we enforce that segmentation, right? Because everyone goes like, oh, well, easy. We just buy a pair of two next generation firewalls. We put it together, HA, and then we do a bypass, and then like VNs and DNCs and all of that. But sometimes that's not feasible, especially for small and medium companies, when you cannot ask for like, oh, yeah, I just want to segment this camera from that PLC, and then you come back with a quote that is $200,000. So it's like we need to make some common sense, and that's why I ask like how we want to enforce that segmentation, okay? Because we are especially, again, coming from uh, uh, Latin America, our default answer will be, we just buy a firewall, <laughs> all right? And uh, of course, there are compliance requirements, that's why I'm putting in the bottom, like dependence if you are uh, compliance or not. Uh, there are certain requirements in how you enforce that segmentation, okay? So back to the topic, and maybe uh, 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 you can check that uh, talk about firewalls. 91% uh, of the firewalls that we review as a service company, it has an unsecure or permissive firewall rule, that we call it. And it, it's, I, it was more than 66 clients' configurations that we review. And what is a permissive or insecure firewall configuration? It has to do with this, right? It's the use of uh, any or all wildcard, either in the source, destination, or ports. That's what I consider, or application, of course. Um, I consider an insecure uh, firewall rule. When you are reviewing your firewalls, please make sure that you have a source, a destination, and your application and ports. But you say, okay, but sometimes I don't know what ports all my SCADA is talking, right? Okay, so go back, there are ways that you can implement solutions, so you verify that only the traffic that you want to be blocked is blocked. So, bear with me. Imagine that you have a allow all firewall at the end, right? You're gonna put now the firewall rule that you think it will match at the top of that rule. Once that the bottom rule is not getting hit with traffic that you don't want to allow, you switch that rule to deny. And that way you verify and confirm that only the traffic that you want is being allowed. I hope it makes sense. But I know they say in your faces that all of you have next generation firewalls. Well, you are pro then because now firewall rules not used to be in the only source, destination, and port. Firewall rules now 
are. Who, what, when, where, why, how. So you can go as far as say, okay, you know what? I want to be an operator. I want to do this only application. Inside that application, you can only do, do this specific action, right? From this specific zone, only at this time frame, right? So remember, you're already paying for this. So why are you not using it, right? So if you already have these next generation capabilities, why you are leaving the operator to be able to write to PLCs in no maintenance windows, for example, right? So those are the easy wins that, again, you're already paying for it. You have the tools, you have the ways to segment it way better, right? And that's what we call like the use of a good segmentation using the tools that you have, assuming that you had a next generation firewall or a UTM. Another example for how to do uh, hardening, right? We're talking about how we're gonna segment the network. We have quick tricks here when it comes to the windows that we can uh, tweak, right? And with this, you'll be surprised that you're gonna mitigate around like let's say 70, 78% of the TTPs out there because they rely on you on don't do that simple checkbox. One of the things is NLA, like network level authentication. So, with that checkbox, right, only a checkbox, you already uh, mitigating an entire um, vector attack that because we don't know where it is, we don't know what it is, we just leave it how it is, right? And sometimes it's like the system integrators, right? We are rushing to get into production um, and we just go and go the default setting. And this is where all these configurations are coming from. Um, and the password length. So if you let by default, your default GPO for your Active Directory, as 90% of the integrators sometimes they do, you already have an insecure password, uh, probably only eight characters enforcement, probably you already have um, uh, NC, uh, SMB and clear text. You don't have NLA. So all this tweet that we can do, it doesn't take time. It doesn't take, uh, um, requires you to like commit or to pay a subscription. These things, you already have it. You just need to go there and do that checkbox. Of course, check with your manufacturing <laughs> uh, before doing these kind of decisions, right? Because 90% uh, of them shouldn't be any transport. It should be pretty straightforward. And one of these is also the disable the removable media. And this is like really um, surprisingly because I always tell everyone like the number one hacker that I always face is a board operator. These guys are creative and they're always gonna find a way to find a way out at connectivity. And 90% of those events are have to do with a USB. A USB modem, a USB key, a USB like when you have, um, I have my game on it, I had a VM on it. Again, those guys get creative and, and always goes, that's one of the main routes that they go. We had another one that is disabled on use services, and uh, this one I think was like three weeks ago. We had an event with IPv6, right? I'm pretty sure like nobody's using IPv6, and if you raise your hands, you're lying. So disable that. <laughs> so there is no need for your PLC to start doing DHCP version six requests to a server. So if you're not using that service, why you expose, why increase your uh, tax surface to something like that? So disable unused services for that. If you work and you receive a plan from a system integrator, this is the default page of your Active Directory environment. And this is the, please, the things that you need to check, the do's and done, right? Uh, we find out, time to time in our services offering the insecure Active Directory configuration. And you'll be surprised, again, and we're not talking about only small, because sometimes people believe that our services are only for like, oh no, it's a small utility out of nowhere. No, we're talking about medium and large uh, companies having the same issue because they have multiple plants, multiple locations, and they don't verify at the time that they put on into production if what they integrator is saying on paper actually match the configuration that they have. And that's where we come in place. We verify those configurations and we find out, oh, 
You're not enforcing anything. You have a character's password. You don't disable password. You can use the same password forever. That's things that we need to consider. And again, it doesn't take too long, except maybe the, the operator is going to be a little bit annoying for you. But uh, that we can deal with that, right? For when it comes to, and, and if you are an operator, close your eyes. Um, because this is what we recommend, right? For we're trying to make your life easier, but at the same time, we're trying to find a balance when it comes to security. And one of the major driving forces that I always ask or uh, team is, hey, why your operator has the ability to open PowerShell? Why? Your operator can be an account, ah, but you're using shared accounts and all of that. Forget about that, okay? Forget that everyone is using the shared password and is writing in a whiteboard, whatever, right? But why you need the privilege to run PowerShell? Why it has the ability to disable Windows Defender? Those are the things that you should check out if you don't want to deal with something as sharing password, um, um, using simple password. You can live with eight characters. That's okay, again, but make sure that you apply the less privileged uh, approach for these accounts, okay? Um, similar to the PLCs, when we, uh, hopefully you had a key and we can put it in run, right? And, and leave it there and only make the switch when we need to make changes in a pro and approved maintenance window. That's one approach, right? And now we make sure that nobody can make changes to the PLC, right? So those are the small steps that you can take to do the control system, but more importantly, please the operator uh, and tire, please. You don't see that level of access coming from that account that is reading in the whiteboard. And I don't mind anymore about the sharing password. I mean, I care, but it's what access that shared password has and all the superpowers that comes with that shared password in the whiteboard. All right, with all of that, of course, the operator is gonna be a little bit mad at you because now you, are making a lot of changes to improve your hardening and your security. But one thing that I will say is, please do this, like check with your vendor compatibility. Maybe they need an obscure reason for why SMV version one needs to be enabled. We don't know, but we can verify and check, right? Do not expect 100 complete compliance, of course. Talking back again about that shared password, maybe we can not get rid of the shared password, never, but at least applying the least privilege in that, that password or that credential being used as a simple user with access only to the tools that they need instead of going full administrator mode. And make one change at a time. That's another thing <laughs> that I would recommend. Don't take this presentation, take it to the board and say, next maintenance window, we are, we are cybersecurity pros. And we're gonna do all these changes, like one at a time, like a small approach, right? One change at a time, no 100 changes. Um, so we can start, for example, with Active Directory and start there once that you're done, keep moving into like the operator role, then moving into your firewalls. One thing at a time that you know for sure that you're working on. Okay, now remember the fifth, uh, fourth element of defensible architecture, and it's about the, how to get into what we call defensible cyber position. And it's as simple as that. I think that picture captures what I mean. If there is a cybersecurity incident in IT, I should be able to go and plug that cable and continue running happy making like jokes about IT and how they're running like monkeys and oh my God, look, they have to pay now ransomware and they have to like, oh, that's funny. That's your ideal cyber position. Be able to isolate and that should be part of your business continuity plan, your disaster recovery plan. It doesn't matter because the priorities is as long as it's safety, I keep running, right? I can uh, operations running, so consider what I need from IT, what I need from DNC, that will keep me running, at least until that situation is addressed. And the opposite should be true. Okay, if I have one plan in a remote location and that get affected, I should be able to isolate that environment without worrying about another one in the other side of the country to be in risk because I had a flat network, for example. So, and we literally see this sign in clients and we were so happy to see it that in the network control room, and the control room, sorry, you can go to the network closet and there is like, pull these two cables. Literally, pull these two cables, even if you suspect, like you see a ghost, go and unplug those cables. Like go for it and that's part of the program and that's what they do, they rather unplug their network and figure it out later what was it 
then be connected, and then start the process of, let's call IT, call OT, put a ticket, get the SOC, oh no, let's go to another ticket, let's get the escalator, they activate the incident response, let's call the retainer, and at the end of the day, you spend like a large number of hours trying to get the process going, and by the time, if it's both side, it's done. The 20 megabytes that they want, the, the secret recipe of your environment, it's gone by that time. So that's what it means to be, be able to go into a, des, a defensible cyber position. So what is next? As I say before, the threats are evolving. Before, we were talking about destruction and people going in through causing damage into the electric grid and do things like that. Maybe, but we haven't seen it. We in Dragos are now seeing a pattern where the people that need to cause damage are probably still there but mostly it's related to espionage, right? Um, yesterday in CERT, we were talking about a water utility that was doing a cybersecurity assessment from the DOD because their water supply for a military base, right? And if they get affected indirectly, the military base can get affected. So those are the considerations that you need to take in place. It's like, why do they want my PLC configuration? Maybe they want your secret way to do a specific um, process, right? They, they are not there to just like, okay, let's disable all of this and put a nice screen and get those millions of dollars. Because the ones who are making the millions of dollars, as you can see in the previous slide, are targeting those small companies with less than 500 employees and with not that much revenue. Where for them, it's like more economic or make more sense to pay the ransom that actually go and do all the jazz to do a restoration, okay? By the way, before you call it, uh, we're not saying here pay the ransom. <laughs> I wanted to get straight right here. So, and a couple of reasons for that, and the mayor that I want you to take with you is, you're gonna become a target and you're gonna get well known that you pay the ransom, and now you're gonna be the target for all the other groups that knows that you pay the ransom. So, things like that, so keep it in mind. And with that, I think I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, happy to answer. Jose, as, as more of our businesses reach into the OT and I, ICS space for data to feed their AI models from a business perspective and business strategy perspective, how do you maintain that segmentation at the firewall level without starting to give more and more tools access across that, that firewall to those devices? So, um, of course, like we see what happened with the like historians, the OCI pie, right? When we had our like, kind of like relay that is localized and then that communicating to the DNC and that communicating to the OT, it's a lot of investments on it, right? And a lot of moving pieces, but I think that's the best approach to something get out of the network. It's a one direction communication that only established from one side to the other, not the other way around, right? And the information that goes out, it can be retained in case that you lose that connectivity. So what happened is you lost the connectivity or I isolate, okay, I go spooky, I unplug the cable, right? Okay, I should know that I have at least 72 hours or data locally before I can go back. And that gives me a buffer that I can retainer. Hey, like, I'm isolated now. Can you give me the go ahead that the, the threat actor is isolated, contained? Maybe I, I, are you done with the forensics before I connect the cable back and connect into it? So I know with the old industry 4.0 where everything talk with everything, um, we're gonna have more segmentation in place hopefully but at least you will have a proxy that manage that connectivity back to OT. And that connection shouldn't be necessary for your continuous production or continuous environment to keep running, that I should have that cable. Because then we had that situation where, okay, like I, I will left then the ransomware spread because I need to keep operations running. So that, I think that's where we're leaning into it. And when it comes to like industry 4.0 and all the future, it will be like micro segmentations and all of that. Again, but that will get really complex really quick uh, as we move forward with the technology that we have. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, first question, 
in your experience working with customers, uh, how many have you seen start implementing unidirectional gateways or diodes uh, to net or uh, make it, you know, to where they can get to the, the control systems, you know? Yeah, so uh, we see a ton of that. Yes, so we're still seeing in a lot of reviews and like network diodes that only allow one-way communication. That's pretty established in the market. But again, I, I feel like nowadays, again, Jose's opinions is, the, like the way the ICS is working is like IT implementing, they go manufacturing, and then the rest of the verticals. And we are in the phase now where manufacturing already moving away from those dials and moving away from those segmentation using firewalls and more um, next generation stuff, right? And then I think slowly now is moving to other verticals because you now start seeing he technologies like SD1 and things that nowhere to be here five years ago. And now we see those industry being implemented there. So we still see him, right? But I think right now what's happening is the slow transitioning into more uh, uh, a firewall direction uh, type of thing, a level seven, yeah. Uh, provide that remote access and things like that. Correct, the network. yes. And last question is advice on maintenance as SLA. If I understand correctly, maintenance SLAs in, in... And trying to do hardening. And trying to do hardening. So um, this is depends on where you're trying to harden, right? There are components that affect your entire network. Let's say firewalls. Touching a firewall invo like involves your entire network behind that firewall, right? So you can implement those firewall rules in a safety manner, as I explained. But if we comes for Active Directory, for example, one change at a time, um, SLAs for your incident retainer, for example, for Dragos, we had 24 hours in case of an incident. We have one hour to react to it, and then we have to like uh, have somebody working on it in at least 24 hours. Uh, so that's something to, like to, to also to consider to your MSP, because also we know that the configuration side of things for firewalls, PLC, sometimes you are not the owner of those, but those SLAs have to build into the contract in in consider cybersecurity incidents because it's a different change of like, okay, we can change this setting in the next maintenance window or I need a lock from that machine now and I don't have anyone who had the credentials or know how to access that PLC. So that's a different story for, and we have encouraged our clients to have a language in their contract for those specific assessments and involve cybersecurity on it. Would that answer your question? Okay. So quick question, I know you covered a lot, thank you. Um, what's the number one cheap win that you see across all these environments that you've been in? What do you, what do you see as like a gotcha that could be like easily remediated? The operator account, I, I think I made it clear like, uh, you, you, the, I know we had a, several instances where the account that is being used across multiple systems to get access to the SCADA is operator and the password is administrator123, right? Okay. Right, and this is like 20 years old password and we get it and there are 200 operators that use it. But you will be surprised to verify that that account has enough privilege and you can reduce and they can continue working by only assign that account to the right GPO. And that's literally an hour of work, maybe an hour and a half. And you are not interrupting them. They, the problem we'll see is like, now when they open, for example, Chrome, and they want to go to YouTube, and we're gonna, oh, what? Why are not allowed to open this? Right, when they go there and just gonna start like pokestar.com, see, like they're gonna be blocking, they were like, what? This thing is blocking me, I'm gonna disable Windows Defender. I cannot do that, right? And, but there will be other options because, oh, can you open SCADA? Yes. Can you ping because I'm a network guy? Yes. Okay, can you do this? Yes. Okay, what else do you need? Right? And sometimes you can allow even like, okay, you need to watch your soccer games. We allow this URL. Nah, let's do something like that. But that's an easy, easy, super quick win. The other ones that I present are a little bit more complex because you're touching multiple settings in multiple environments. But that won't be my number one suggestion. Hey, uh, at one point we were talking about uh, segmentation and the use of firewalls. Yeah. But uh, when you're going into some of these legacy OT environments, how much could you do uh, percentage-wise by just saying, 
okay, this asset talks to that asset, they get a VLAN, they get an unmanaged switch. That's it, no in, no out, they don't need it. So what I do is like you say, there is networks that need to talk, right? So I understand that there are limitations of the next generation firewall, especially in OT, that they, oh, we good? Oh, just fine. All right, which is good. Um, so especially in OT where the firewalls sometimes don't identify the application that those two assets are talking, and those are legacy devices. Um, but what we want to avoid is the use of all, to all and all. So that's, that's the, my only ask for now when it comes to firewall rules is, yeah, you need to talk with this asset, but you don't need to talk Telnet, you don't need to talk HTTP, you don't need to talk all these protocols um, that are not necessary, like IPv6 as a sample. So uh, I think I'm trying to answer your question, like between two legacy systems, how often I found a firewall between those two legacy systems? Never, like I, usually they're open. Are there projects for new plans to put firewalls? Yes, um, and I think that's the process. I don't think it will be easy to just interrupt a system that has 20 years already working and just to put a firewall in the middle. I have to be like a risk assessment uh, before I can make the decision. But I hope I answered the questions. I don't know, like, if not, we can talk about that offline. Again, firewall is my favorite topic and we like hours about it.